Welcome back, everybody, to the You Ask We podcast, the show where you ask the questions, they answer them, and I'm just the guy in the middle. In this episode, we have a great guest. He's a legal disruptor and the founder of My Legal Academy, which innovately innovatively transforms law firms with automation and strategic growth. He has over 32,000 law firm clients and he generates all of them while blending a legal expertise with a passion for tech and innovation, all while guiding lawyers to just overall success and a good work-life balance. I wanna give a warm welcome to Mr. Sam Malai. Sam, how's it going? Amazing, amazing, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's have some fun today. <laughs> excited to have you here. Um, so the way this show works, you know, is um, pretty much people have a chance to submit questions um, about you, trying to ask about you, what you do. But the first question always comes from me, and that's what's new? What's new is just uh, scaling. Um, pretty much last year was uh, the year, uh, the word of the year was consolidation. Uh, basically, I was running seven law firms um, along with the online academy. And it was really overwhelming that plus trying to throw a live conference I basically just peaked of a amount of input that I could do uh, myself to be able to basically uh, run eight operations. Um, and I, as I was building up to the uh, our own conference, I realized I'm like, this is not sustainable. So I made a goal that I, when I come from the other side, I have to come out much smarter, much more efficient and kind of redefine my role in my law firms, consolidate, try to get out of a couple of my uh, lower performing law firms so I could focus and hyper-focus on, on the top ones. And uh, I could say that it turned out to be true. I was able to uh, get out of uh, exit three of my law firms and now just focusing on my top four law firms and also focusing a lot more on my legal academy. Awesome. And I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm glad to hear that the goal's um, going well. Uh, it's great to hear. So let's start with a few of these um, legal. Uh, let's start with a few of these uh, questions. You know, this first one comes from Adam. Uh, he wants to know what's a legal disruptor because you call yourself that. But uh, honestly, I agree with him. I'm not 100 percent sure what that is. So, what is that? It's someone who challenges the status quo and doesn't see the world as the way that they are. Um, I'd like to uh, see myself as an opportunist somewhere, somebody who sees opportunities in everything um, and also thinks ahead. So when I saw, when I worked in the legal space, I realized that first of all, it is not what I expected. Uh, and second of all, it doesn't have to be so black and white. Uh, there could be a lot of room for improvements, for creativity, technology, a lot of business ideas of scaling and leverage, all those things to be brought out in, into the space. And the time when I started, all these concepts are like virtual, automated, and things weren't really applied to the legal space. So I had a good four or five year head start uh, before the whole COVID thing happened. And then at that point, uh, COVID kind of pushed kind of the virtual and the automated narrative. Um, and that helped me really put it out there more um, and um, really helped a lot. Um, so just about kind of seeing things differently and, and doing something about it. So would you want to go into like a little more detail about what exactly you're doing like differently than everyone else? Sure. So I kind of self-proclaimed myself a couple of months ago as the chief strategy officer of my law firm. So, um, and why did I do that? Uh, one is I, I think it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile to think more, um, and everybody needs to think more. A lot of people, I think, I just try to do. So I try to spend 80% 80, 80 of my time just strategically thinking and planning. And then the rest is being able to delegate and automate or even eliminate, not do a lot of things that other people do. Um, so what I do is kind of strategically um, know how to market online. I, I know how to use online marketing, specifically uh, online advertisement. Um, a lot of social media ads to be able to basically uh, run ads to be able to generate clients for my law firms. I know how to do that pretty well. Um, and I'd be able to learn how to scale it. Um, now we spend, uh, it's kind of weird for me to say, but almost close to a million dollars a month on ads. Um, and it's uh, turned out to be pretty fruitful on the back end. And then the second part of the challenge is um, not just generating the leads, but also actually getting them signed up which has actually been a 
more of an art and a science to it. Um, and for that, that's been like one of the main focuses to learn how to sign up hundreds of leads and how to, how to sign up hundreds of clients um, a month. Um, so that's kind of figuring that part of the, uh, the, the puzzle pretty much has been my main focus. That's awesome. And I mean, you know, moving on to a kind of different focus, if it is, um, this next question comes from Dylan. Um, he wants to know what made you go into founding um, your project, My Legal Academy, instead of just running your own firm. So I still run four law firms yeah. uh, to this day. So that's, I think, is the secret sauce and competitive advantage I have in my space is a lot of these people in my space, the only thing that they know is just how to market, the how to market to get the lawyer signed up. My experience is hands-on, practical, current, relevant to generating clients now. Um, so what kind of triggered me to kind of want to start my online academy, teaching lawyers how to uh, generate clients was actually about uh, five years ago when I figured things out. First, I did it for myself. Then I'm like, wait a minute, not only can I do it for myself, I could do it for other lawyers. So I basically made a hit list of all the personal injury lawyers that I knew in Los Angeles. One by one, started uh, going in for meetings and signing them up, signed up a good handful of those clients. And one of those clients had a consultant who, who basically sat in on this meeting. And this consultant was this older gentleman. And he started asking me these very particular kind of marketing questions, like what's your landing page conversion rate? What's your click-through rate? And all these particular questions that only like a good sophisticated marketer would understand. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, wait a minute, his, his knowledge of the space doesn't really match what he looks like. Um, and he ended up, this gentleman ended up being my mentor and still is to my mentor to this day. I talked to him multiple times a day. Um, and myself, when I started working with him and learning from him, uh, that's when I realized, wait, um, he's able to consolidate decades of experience when it comes to business development, marketing, and hiring, and everything else that comes to growing into p little pieces of nuggets of information that he's giving me. A five-minute conversation it just changes the trajectory of my, of my life, essentially. And I'm like, not only did I see it in my life that impacted my life, I'm like, wait a minute, can I package this up and offer this uh, mentorship, this guidance, and this value that, that could be translated through knowledge and information to other people. And that's when I started my first program called Legal Funnel, teaching lawyers how they could generate uh, clients online with funnels. Um, and then while I was doing that, I realized I'm like, wait a minute, it's not just about generating clients and funnels. There's more to it. There's also the automation. There's also hiring. There's also the math behind everything, the numbers and the KPIs and everything else in between. So that's where we kind of rebranded to My Legal Academy to be a more wholesome brand, all about learning uh, for growth. And then also, again, the same idea about eight, uh, about 10 months ago, I realized, wait a minute, there's more to it too. There's also, but there's more to it than like being well-balanced and fulfillment, relationships, uh, God, uh, you know, everything else that also really, really matters. So we actually switched our mindset. We, we decided to uh, make information free. So everything that I was kind of uh, gatekeeping behind closed doors, of all the information that we were, you know, sell to our, to our members. We're like, you know what? We are launching the lawyer club where we're going to give away all the information and all the resources, not just information, but a lot of the resources and templates and things that everybody, uh, not only did I use myself, but hundreds of lawyers have used in the past couple of years. We're going to give that away to, and to feel free to join our community. That's called lawyer club. If, by the way, if you go to, if you're a lawyer, uh, feel free to join. It's called, uh, go to join lawyerclub.com. But if you need help implementing all the information that's shared here, then we have law firm growth implementers that could come and uh, set this up for you. So this is kind of how the transition of kind of, you know, having my own mentor to now uh, deciding to mentor other people and then from the mentorship, teach, teaching and now realizing, wait, actually the implementation is what matters. And that's what we help with now. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And I got to be honest, it sounds like a lot. And I got, I mean, Based on that, uh, moving on to the next question coming from Michael, um, what like specific challenges would you say like you have considered while disrupting the legal industry? Like what were your biggest challenges in your opinion? Um, the biggest challenge is implementing ultimately because a lot of people can on the service level understand that yes, you need to hire. Yes, you need to set up some automations. Yes, you need to have a CRM and all do all these things. But a lot of people I think, uh, think 
um, are, are challenged with doing this what needs to get done. And the challenge behind that is I'm too busy to get that done. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, when you keep going deeper and deeper, it's the person themselves is the biggest challenge. And that is starts off with a mindset shift to really understand who you are, what you're good at, what you thrive at, what you're not good at, what you don't thrive at, what you don't like doing, and really honing it in on that so that you'll be able to kind of know what that is and surround yourself with all the resources and people and, and the tools you need to be able to complement yourself. So that's why I kind of focus me, myself, self-proclaimed chief strategy officer, because that's my that's what I'm good at. I'm good at thinking and strategizing, planning and thinking ahead. So if that's the case, I surround myself with the, uh, the salespeople, the doers, the client success people, the marketers, if need be, whatever that is. So that's the ultimate challenge is knowing yourself. And what I could, I could share value with, with your audience who's listening in. Um, uh, about six months ago, I was thinking of hiring a life coach. And um, when I decided to do this, I decided to hire, bring my mentor into this conversation. So I let my, uh, the life coach was asking my mentor some questions. It was our initial kind of discovery call. And he, uh, the life coach started asking the mentors some very specific questions about, you know, what are your challenges? What do you do? All this stuff. And while he was asking him these questions, I started answering them. I started writing them down. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, and I started writing them down. And all of a sudden, I realized I, ha I have these notes about myself. And the notes, uh, these are the things that I kind of, these sections um, that I kind of wrote down. Adjectives that describe me, my challenges, uh, what I'd rather be doing, what are the side effects if I don't do what I, uh, that I like doing, what's the desired result I would like to have in my role. And based on that, I basically went into ChatGPT and I filled in the holes. And I basically told ChatGPT, hey, you're somebody who's a life coach. You're going to help me figure out what kind of person I am. So these are adjectives that I think I am. What other adjectives can describe me? And then ChatGPT would come back and give me 10 more adjectives. And from that list, I'm like, mm, this is good. This one doesn't matter, but this one is good. And it started basically creating this comprehensive list. And I followed through with this, trying to create the most comprehensive list of all those things, adjectives that describe me, my challenges, et cetera. And I had this very long, thorough Google Doc of information about me. And then I took that, went back to the same conversation with ChatGPT, and I said, hey, given everything you know about me that I'm about to give you, what do you think will be my perfect role? If I, uh, going back a year before, I started having these thoughts about, hey, what would be a perfect role? And in my head, I'm like, hmm, chief strategy officer would be cool. So when I was about to press enter onto ChatGPT, I'm like, if ChatGPT tells me that chief strategy officer is my perfect role, that's a complete validation of everything that I've thought about and everything that I've done up to this point in my life. And lo and behold, the words came out, given your profile, the role of chief strategy officer appears to be the most suitable uh, most suitable for you. And here's why. And he gave me all the reasons and he perfectly tied in everything that I've done to this point in my life. And it was like a perfect moment. I'm like, ah, it's like a perfect aha moment for me. And that's when I realized who I really am. And that's what I thrive at. And now that also means, again, as we explained earlier, everything else has to be delegated. Everything else has to be automated somehow. Um, and I think that that's where everybody's secret sauce is at. Knowing yourself uh, clearly and then surround yourself with the complimentary stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And it, it's it's funny how you said you got validation from AI pretty much because um, this next question comes from Kelsey. And speaking of like, you know, AI and online ads, you also mentioned that before. Uh, she wants to know what types of technologies would you say have proven to be really effective in the legal automation landscape? I think any answer that I give won't get trumped by AI as the answer. So completely, I know it's a lot of, you know, a lot of people are talking about it, but really um, specifically ChatGPT, I don't think there's a more practical tool of AI than ChatGPT. And, and I'm still surprised when I go out to the world and the real world and people know that I talk about AI and ChatGPT, people still come up to me like, hey, I'm trying to figure this out. Like, how do you use it? I'm like, have you used it yet? I'm like, no. I'm like, well, how are you supposed to learn how to use it? 
So yeah, the short answer is ChatGPT, and it really it, nobody can teach you as well as you just going in and actually start using it. And I think the best way to use it is just to just vent whatever questions or things you're even thinking about. It doesn't matter. There's no right, wrong way to ask it. Um, there are some pointers about uh, giving a context to ChatGPT. Try to give as much information as possible before you press enter. You know, your your prompts should be at least a paragraph long, ideally sometimes even paragraphs and, and pages. Um, but once you give it context and it, uh, you're very clear on what you need and what your decisions are that you're trying to make, then it really is the best tool by far that I've ever been exposed to my entire life. And it probably will be for you as well. So yeah, ChatGPT for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I feel like it's really interesting, especially with, um, I mean, everything that's going on today with AI. Cause I mean, at first when ChatGPT was introduced, um, there was a split like 50, 50 as to like, is this useful or is this crap? Right. Like there was a strong 50, 50, like in the beginning when it first came out and now like at least half a year to a year later, you know, like it's gone to a point where pretty much any and every website is using at least similar technology, if not the same technology as chat GBT. Like, for example, like like more specifically in the legal field, like especially like when ChatGPT like first became a thing and like one lawyer used ChatGPT to like cite like his cases like for court, found out they found out he was using ChatGPT because it was using fake cases because there was no legal database and then he got sanctioned and everyone looked at him like, oh, like he's a fool, obviously. But now Lexus AI is a thing. And I think that's very interesting because like Lexus AI, it's using the conversational like aspect of chat GBT and like the same tech, but it also has that legal database from Lexus Nexus to like back it up. So I just think it's really interesting how it's taking over. Um, Shamath Abatio, who's like a, one of the smartest people in the world. He's one of the, um, found, uh, the investors, one of the main investors of Facebook and all these different big companies. He says that he expects AI to get improved 800 to 1600 times by 2026. So 1600 times will be better in two wow. years. And a lot of people, when they use ChatGPT, yes, and I have some people in my life who like talk shit about ChatGPT, give me the wrong answer. I'm like you, you don't get the point. It's not about the right answer. It's about what it's capable of and how it will get better over time. If it's just good now, it'll only get better. This is the worst it will ever be. So mm -hmm. in six months, it'll be crazy faster. Exactly. 1600 times better in two years. That's, that's crazy. Our mind can't even understand what that means. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Um, did, did you just Google that stat now or I like, no. <laughs> I, I forgot the year. I knew it was 1600 times. I just didn't know. What that's was great. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So oh, let's get into some of these anonymous questions now. Uh, this first one. Uh, what would you say is the biggest success story from those that have used the strategies you preach? So we have a bunch. Um, we have a lot of people who've been able to double their law firm revenue uh, within 12 months. And actually we had a whole award ceremony at our conference, giving awards to those people who have been able to at least minimum double their law firm revenue. Those are cool, great, especially if you never doubled your revenue within 12 months. Amazing. But the ones that I, I really like are the ones who... Uh, come in to our program who are kind of burnt out and stressed out because they don't have a handle on their systems and their team and everything that's going on. And then talking to them a year later to uh, hear and sense the sense of calmness and controlness and, you know, less, uh, less stress that, it did, that they were at 12 months prior. That is amazing because that really affects people's life and their health and actually their family and their relationships and everything else not just their livelihood so i have a bunch of those um and yeah those are there's a bunch of them posted on our website yeah i mean that's awesome if whoever submitted that question if you're more interested to learn more stories definitely check them out uh i'll all the links are going to be down in the bio so you'll see them later uh yeah this next question because you, you have a pretty big social media presence. Like, I don't know, um, whoever's watching this episode, they for sure follow you. They see all your, you know, reels and like clips and YouTube and things like that. Um, so how would you say social media benefited your business or career or anything else? I think I, I don't, 
I might be the perfect example where you don't need a high account. Like, let's just say you said that. And some people will be like, I don't know how many that is. So it could be 100,000. That could be 30,000. That could be 10,000. And you go and you're like, wait, this guy only has 3,000 Instagram followers or 4,000, however many it is. It, it's, uh, um, when it comes to social media, it's about the impact that you have. Not, uh, and how deep you go with the person, the relationships that you have with the, with the followers that you have more than account. Uh, in our space, in social media, there's plenty of people that I know that have a million that I know with the 99.9% uh, certainty that 99% of them are fake. And even those ones, even that 1%, that person wouldn't be able to get as much, uh, you know, results from those 1%. So be very mindful. Uh, the number doesn't really necessarily mean, you know, what they can do with it. So in my head, I have a pretty conservative, um, good amount that I need to be able to do what I do. Um, um, and that's been uh, fruitful for me. I don't go all out on my own social media because I am more, I'm a more behind the scenes kind of person. I let my systems and my ads and stuff basically help me do what I do. Uh, especially obviously when it comes to, um, ads specifically. Um, so in that regard, it's been life-changing. Um, I think learning how to master paid advertisement, social media advertisement when it comes to Facebook ads, Instagram ads, YouTube ads, TikTok ads, and Google ads, uh, have definitely helped me, you know, uh, make some money. So in that regard, yeah, life-changing. And that's one of the main things that we help other lawyers with. We show them exactly, um, pretty much not necessarily do it themselves, but how to hire the right people. And if we do hire the right people, we'll have, how to hold them accountable and how to have the backend system to be able to actually sign up clients from it, not just go do it. So yeah, the definitely life-changing. Yeah. I mean, I got to say, I feel like when it comes to ads on social media, it's like, it really depends how much money you put into the ad specifically, like when it comes to viewership, am I wrong? Or No. Yeah. It's not about that at all. Um, it's about your cost per acquisition and what, you, what's the value you get per client. So, and everybody could be playing a different game. If somebody, let's just say a little uh, simple uh, exercise, if somebody can make $5,000 off a client and somebody only makes $2,000, even if the person who's making $5,000, if, if they're spending $2,000, they'll beat the person who can uh, only make $2,000 off a client. So there's some backend numbers that really matter, which is kind of like, again, a quick little example. Um, so backend numbers. And then second is your conversion rate. It's not just about how much could you spend and you know what you, how much you're investing. If you don't have the backend system to go to actually sign them up, then you can spend the money all day long and you don't want to sign them up. Um, I went on a full force mode and spending as much as money as possibly could. And our systems, even though we were very robust, was too much. So it was the first time actually in a couple of years that we put a pause for two weeks so we can even catch up to everything, which we never want to do because it kills us because we know we could just go spend money and make more money. But we're like, no, let's, let's slow down. Let's try to catch up to everything we're doing. So no, there's more to it. It's not just about, you know, who has the most money. Yeah. And I mean, We've been talking a lot about like different trends that are kind of taking over. On one hand, you have AI getting into like the legal space and things like that. And then on the other hand, everyone and their mother has a social media representing their business. And it's a big, big factor. Um, this next anonymous question, it's asking like, uh, what, what trends in general, like, do you think would shape the future of the legal industry? This might be ahead of its time, but I'll just put it out there. Uh, I think it's autonomous agents. Autonomous agents is just AI plus mm -hmm. these agents that go get stuff done for you. And actually, I've been thinking about this for the last six months. I'm like, I know this is where the, the next level that we'll get to. And I've been going around asking these experts. I was, at, I was at an ABA tech show conference two weeks ago. And I'm going around to these experts. I'm like, hey, what do you think of, of autonomous agents? And they didn't know what I was talking about. And I realized I'm like so far ahead of this whole game trying to figure out the next level, next level that maybe I might be a little bit too early to this. But yeah, um, just it's basically just imagine AI as the middle piece, but in the back end is things being done for you. So that usually practical level is that AP, uh, the, the, the AI either gets zapped, a Zapier or API'd out for actions to be done, whether it be, uh, be emails being sent, notifications being sent to your clients or leads or things to be filed for you. Um, I think that's where it's at. And the ultimate goal is to be have a fully, fully autonomous law firm where just from the get-go, you collect all the information you need from the client 
and then your autonomous agents take care of the rest. They collect all your documents for you. They do any filing that needs to be done. They do the whatever that needs to get done. And maybe right before it gets filed, the lawyer reviews it to make sure that everything checks out. But everything else, for the, for the most part, 80%, just autonomous agents running it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that sounds like really awesome and futuristic. I mean, is there anything like that that's like out now? Like, are they making like substantial first steps or? Um, right now it's in the realm of marketing when it comes to getting bookings from leads. Um, and that's actually my first when AI came out. That that was the part of the puzzle that I was trying to figure out is how can I get AI to go text leads to get them signed up? And at the same time, all these, the, these chatbots came out where basically um, a lot of people were trying to figure it out. A lot of companies were trying to figure out right now the stage we're at is these AI agents that will come and text your leads. Um, and then um, basically the, the, the AI will try to qualify the lead, basically ask a series of questions to see if they qualify. And if they qualify, the agent will basically send them a booking link to get them booked into a calendar. So the intake will take over and get them signed up. My vision with that a year ago was to actually, can I get the AI to get them signed up? It doesn't work for every practice type, um, but for some it does. Um, for one of my practice types, it works well for that. And I actually ended up signing up seven, uh, 70 clients for, uh, from with this AI agent. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, I think our intake team to, uh, took over and we ended up hiring 30, 40 intakers for that, for that law firm, but we'd like to go back to it and get that uh, set up again because yeah, the why, you know, instead of having 10 intakers, you could just have two really good intakers who are managing these, uh, these AI agents. That's awesome. I mean, God willing, it all works out. And, um, you know, kind of going back to like, uh, the intro, um, this next anonymous question kind of focuses on uh, the fact that you help guide people to a healthy work-life balance. So this question is asking, what, what's the secret sauce to that? We've been mentioning secret sauce this whole time. Like, what's the secret sauce to a good, healthy work-life balance? It's a controlled schedule of your perfect week that's in your calendar before the week starts. I think a lot of people start their week and it's like, whatever that comes my way, I got to deal with it. Or usually it's like, I have some important stuff. I have some court stuff. I have some meetings booked throughout the week, but in the middle chaos and life ensues and whatever that is, then so be it. So um, ideally blocking out your entire week very clearly in a very systematic kind of, you know, str structured way. Um, and then second is having control of notifications of input that are coming to you whether that be notifications or emails or calls that the, you having gatekeepers or focus mode on your phone enabled so that there's no distractions throughout your day. So big picture, schedule, and then ongoing, cutting, cutting out those distractions from social media, email, and text and calls. Nice. I mean, yeah, people just make sure you use that to stay healthy. Um, so this last anonymous question, um, kind of taking a sharp left turn here. Uh, what's, what's your take on Bitcoin? So <laughs> I am a huge believer in Bitcoin. Um, got into it in 2017. So it's been six years. And today I actually got a comment. I, I made a, a post about Bitcoin on my Facebook that basically said, here's a summary of what I think 2024 is going to look like uh, for Bitcoin space. And I'm actually read it because if people that are interested in it, I think it really summarizes what to expect this year. Number one is the Bitcoin halving is happening right around uh, April 20th or so. And for people that don't know what that is, that it's a it's a part of the cycle of Bitcoin that happens every four years. I don't want to get into taking all the of what happens, but long story short, the, the amount of Bitcoins that are mined every day, it gets cut in half. That means the supply is basically cut in half. And whenever that happens every four years and it happens the fourth time that's happening, then the three months prior, which is the stage we're at, usually there's a there's a uh, increase in price, but especially the three months after the having is where most of the action happens, most of the increase happens. So we're in that crucial six months period that in the four years this is where most of the action happens. And we have entered it. We have been in it in the past month. We we're definitely in it today. Uh, the time we're recording this, it's at fifty five thousand. It could be down or it could be less or more. But for the most part, if you if you listen to this recording in six months from now, um, probably around um, 
maybe August or so, then it will see that it's actually much different. The price is much different than what it is now, a lot more than what it is now. Um, and it's very cyclical. Um, so that's something to have in mind. Other, other recent update that really recently happened was just a month ago, uh, Bitcoin ETFs um, uh, got released. Uh, ETFs are essentially, it's a way for people to be able to trade and buy and buy and sell Bitcoin on exchanges that just got released just a month ago, but nobody's talking about it. It's not in mainstream media because mainstream media is on the side of banks and they don't want that to be disrupted. So that's been happening, uh, you know, uh, behind closed, uh, not behind closed doors, but kind of under wraps. Um, also, there'll be more money printing. If you understand things about, you know, where the economy is with the interest rates and the trillion dollar in debt, uh, in debt that we're paying for per year, do you know that the, there'll be more money printing? Also, there'll be rate cuts and there'll be more and more adoption because all Bitcoin is, is just a, it's a way to electronically transfer value to each other. So it's just the adoption of technology to money. So all those things are happening all at once. It's going to be an amazing year and I'm super excited. And uh, all I recommend is people that are interested in it, don't just get into it. You, because most people that, that do get into it, get into it when it's when everybody starts talking about it. And that's usually not a good time to get into it. I recommend uh, finding a YouTube channel called Invest Answers. On YouTube, just search for Invest Answers. It does a really good job of explaining it and teaching it. Um, at least teach yourself, take some time to learn more about it. And then once you get comfortable, then then you'll be ready to do whatever yeah, you choose. I to. Yeah, I also wanted to clarify too. It's like you're not you're not a financial expert, right? Correct. <laughs> okay, I, so I never, I never told what to what to is, do. What this to is do. not financial people, advice. Yeah, <laughs> this is just opinion. It's all good. All right, just quick disclaimer, and we're good. So, um, yeah, I mean. You know, so the way the show works, uh, the first question always comes from me. And the last question also always comes from me. And that's, if you had to give one piece of advice to the people watching at home, what would you tell them? Is to know where your competitive advantage is and triple down on it. Um, everybody has some expertise in certain things or they know something better than other people. And a lot of people question themselves. Don't question yourself. Hone in on it. Ask yourself, how can I do more of this? Double down and triple on whatever you're best at. Mm -hmm. no, know your role, ladies and gentlemen. Sam, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. If you guys like this episode, please make sure to like and subscribe. It only helps get more better videos for you guys. If you guys want to see what's going on with, uh, with the show, who's coming on next, things like that, make sure to Follow the socials. My links are going to be down below. If you want to see what's going on with Sam, I'm going to make sure to add his links down below as well. And with that, this has been the You Ask Me podcast. My name is Evan Toronto. This is Dan Malai. And I'll see you guys next week. Yup. Yeah. Yeah.